everybody and welcome um, to this Food for Thought seminar. Um, so I'm presenting for you this evening or this afternoon. My name is Ali Barnes. Um, I'm a dietitian. Um, so I have a background of working in the NHS um, in hospitals and GP practices, giving people advice about uh, ways that they can change their diet to help to manage different health conditions. Um, and for the last six years, I've been working in research as a dietitian in research um, on a study relating to type 2 diabetes. And that's the subject um, of my talk tonight. So I've called it shaking off type 2 diabetes. It's a, it's a really positive message for people who have this condition. Um, and hopefully the reason it's called shaking off will make sense um, as I go through the slides. So I'll run through the presentation and then we'll probably have five minutes at the end if anyone wants to ask a question or if you think of anything while I'm talking, just um, I think you should have a chat function and you can possibly pop it in the chat function or I'll save it till the end and just ask me a question and I'll be happy to answer any of those. Okay, so I'm just going to, um, I think we might have someone else in the waiting room now, just going to let them in. Okay, and I'll just start the presentation. Start the presentation if my button works, there we go. Okay, so within about half an hour, I'm gonna cover just a little bit of, of background in terms of what diabetes actually is and what happens in the body and in, in the type of diabetes um, that we're thinking about, which is type two diabetes. Um, I'll tell you just a little bit about what the usual treatments are um, for type two diabetes and then move on to looking specifically at our research that we've done from Newcastle University, which has used diet as therapy um, to shake off type two diabetes for lots of people. And then at the end, I'll cover how this research is being used and, and translated um, into real life treatment for type two diabetes. So what is diabetes? Well, first of all, it's, it's quite prevalent in, in the English population. So six people out of every 100 or 6% um, of people have diabetes. Um, and someone is diagnosed with the condition about every three minutes in the UK. And it's a condition where the body isn't able to regulate blood glucose and that That's often referred to as run higher. And there are two main types of diabetes, and you might have heard of, of one or both of them. Um, but there is type 1 diabetes and also type 2 diabetes. And most people who have diabetes have that second type, type 2 diabetes. So nine out of every 10 people who have diabetes have type 2. So when we're thinking about um, diabetes, what, what this slide is going to show us is how our bodies usually control the blood glucose levels. So if you use your imagination a bit and imagine that this is a blood vessel inside the body, um, when we eat food and drinks, when we consume them, our body digests them down into lots of smaller molecules, including glucose, and that's represented by the sugar cubes here. And when the glucose is absorbed into the bloodstream, it sends a signal like that Wi-Fi signal there um, to one of our organs called the pancreas. And the pancreas is an organ, it's shaped a bit like a fish and it's about the size of a large mackerel, I have been told. Um, and it's located, it's tucked in behind your stomach um, on the left-hand side of your body. And so high glucose levels in the blood after we've eaten, send a signal to that organ, the pancreas, and as a result, it makes a substance called insulin. And if you think of insulin as being a bit like a chemical key, it's a hormone. And that means that it's a messenger in the body and it's got lots of different jobs to do. And one of the jobs of insulin is to work like a key to unlock the body cells. And that lets the glucose out of the bloodstream where we don't want it to be and into cells like our muscle cells, where it's really good at providing us with energy. And so we will release 
just the right amount of insulin after a meal, just the right number of insulin keys to get the glucose out of the bloodstream. And we'll either use that energy, so if we were going for a walk after we'd had something to eat or we were, we were doing some sport, um, our muscles would be working um, and we would use up the glucose straight away for energy, or we might store it for later um, in our muscles and in our liver as well. And in type 2 diabetes, this whole system doesn't work quite as well as it usually does. And so if we think about the two different types, in type 1 diabetes, the body mistakenly turns on the cells that make those insulin keys in the pancreas and destroys them. And it's what's called an immune response. So our, our, our defense systems turn on the cells and, and destroy them. And that means that people who have type 1 diabetes, their pancreas can't make any any insulin at all. So there's no insulin keys to get the glucose out of the bloodstream, um, which means that people with type 1 diabetes have to inject insulin to replace the keys that, that the pancreas can't make to control the glucose levels. Now type 2 diabetes, which is the one that our research focuses on, there are a couple of different things that go wrong with the insulin or that happen with the insulin in type 2 diabetes. So either the pancreas isn't making as much insulin as it was before, um, or the insulin that it makes doesn't work quite as well. And we sometimes talk about, if you look at the muscle cell and you can see the lock on the muscle cell, um, and that's because cells are quite careful at what they let in and they let out. And so the, the insulin key fits this lock specially. But we think about people who have type 2 diabetes having rusty locks on those muscle cells. And if you have ever tried to open a door that's got a rusty lock, you might have the key, um, but the lock is making it more difficult. And it means that the insulin in, in the body just doesn't work quite as well to do um, the same job. And it means that um, in people with type 2 diabetes, and as well as people with type 1 diabetes, the glucose levels in the blood tend to run higher, and especially if they eat lots of things, um, lots of sugary foods um, that are broken down into that, that glucose in the bloodstream. So why might the high sugar levels in the blood be a problem? Well, Oh, sorry, I'll just cover this first of all, particularly for the type 2 diabetes. So there are three main problems, three main areas in the body that cause that problem with the insulin. Um, so at the top there, it's in the muscles. So as I mentioned, the insulin keys don't work as well in those muscle cell locks because they're a bit rusty. And people can help that by being um, more active. That helps to, to oil the locks and helps the insulin to work a bit better. Um, at the bottom left of the triangle, inside the livers um, of people who have type 2 diabetes, tends to be a buildup of fat inside the liver. And that causes the liver to push out extra glucose from its stores into the system. And so if there's extra glucose in the blood, it means that the pancreas has to make even more insulin keys. And as we know, they're not working very well. And so that can cause the, the glucose levels to be higher as well. And then at the bottom right of the triangle, um, the pancreas um, in people with type 2 diabetes is much slower at making the insulin keys. So usually when we have something to eat and we need the insulin keys, the, the pancreas is really quick at sending them out into the bloodstream. But in type 2 diabetes, the pancreas is much slower to do that. And that's because there's some a tiny amount of fat in the pancreas that's, that's clogging things up as well. So why are the higher glucose levels um, a problem? Well, these are some of the, the problems that can be linked with diabetes, which, which helps us to understand why it's quite important to look at better ways of treating it. So in the short term, people might feel really thirsty if they've got high glucose levels. Um, and it's the concentration of the sugar or the glucose in the blood um, means that um, it, it draws water out of the system and people have to pass lots of urine and, and people can find that they're having to get up during the night to go to the toilet um, several times and that then makes them makes them very thirsty. So even if you have a, have a drink, you still feel really, really thirsty afterwards. Um, people can get some, some blurred vision. So, so the lens in the eye absorbs some of the sugar that's in the blood and it changes the shape of the eye. So it's blurred vision that, that comes and goes um, can be a sign as well. 
and feeling really tired because if you think the glucose is stuck in the blood and it's not getting into those muscle cells where it's going to provide the body with energy and so people can feel um, really exhausted um, and a lot of the symptoms actually things like feeling tired a bit of blurred vision having to go to the loom more are, are quite vague and people don't realize that, that there's something wrong quite a lot of the time um, now, infections are also um, one of the problems with high sugar levels, and it gives um, the bacteria for infection something to feed on, which can mean that they take longer to, to get rid of the infections. Um, or if there are wounds, the wounds take a bit longer to heal as well. Um, some people lose lots of weight, and that's mostly with type 1 diabetes, where there's no insulin at all and the glucose levels are very, very high. Um, and so, again, there's no energy getting into the cells and people lose a lot of weight. But a lot of people, and especially with type 2 diabetes, have no symptoms at all. And they, they feel absolutely fine, but it's, it's about what's going on behind the scenes as much as how people feel. And once the glucose levels are high for, for a longer period of time, so over a number of years, if you think of the, the bloodstream as a bit like the motorway system around the body and it, and it carries cells or everywhere around the blood body, and the glucose levels can cause problems in, in lots of different places. So um, it can cause um, heart problems like, like heart attacks. Um, it can be damaged to, to the kidneys, um, damage to the nerves, especially um, in the feet and in the legs, and you can lose sensation in the feet, um, get problems like ulcers on the legs, um, it can cause problems in the eyes and damage in the eyes, and also um, problems in the brain, so things like stroke and also memory loss and problems like dementia as well. So, so it sounds really serious, but the positive news with diabetes is always that the risks of those problems, they're not inevitable. And the risks of them developing are hugely reduced if, if we help people to make positive changes to, to what they eat, um, to how active they are, and also to maintaining a healthy weight as well. Um, because when people carry lots of extra weight, and particularly weight around the middle, around the tummy area, that makes it harder for insulin um, to do its job. Um, and so these are this is what um, leads to the usual treatments for type 2 diabetes. So when type 2 diabetes, when I see someone in clinic who's been told that they have type 2 diabetes, it's about those positive messages. So they need to be aware that there can be problems over the longer term, but these are the things that can be done about it. And the first step is usually to eat more healthily and to be more active. Um, and then people will usually start on some tablets and medication that can help them control the glucose levels, but they don't replace the advice about eating more healthily and being more active. They're there to make up what the, the healthy lifestyle isn't able to do. Um, and then some people will test um, their blood glucose as well, either by pricking their finger or there are now some sensors that people wear on the back of their arms and they use their mobile phone to swipe over the top. Um, and that gives a reading um, of the blood glucose levels. Um, and that can help people to, to check that their levels aren't going um, too high or too low, um, but also to help them understand the effect that food has and, and what foods um, they're able to eat without pushing their levels up too much. Um, but eventually with type 2 diabetes, after having it for, for quite a long long time, so about 10 years, about half of people still end up needing to top up those, those insulin keys by having um, some insulin injections. So you can't take insulin as a tablet because it's a protein and your body would digest it. Um, so people have to inject it. And they, these were the kind of conversations that I would have with people. And we thought that once you had type 2 diabetes that you would always have type 2 diabetes, um, but that you could manage it. But then there are two professors, and they're both both my big bosses um, on the research study that I've worked on. So, so on the left hand side is Professor Taylor from Newcastle University, and on the right hand side is Professor Lean um, from Glasgow University. And we did a research study together that was funded by Diabetes UK. And this was to see whether through diet we could actually return the blood glucose levels entirely back to normal without needing tablets to do it. So Professor Taylor particularly thinks about what's happening in the body and how that idea of, we call it remission, um, if the glucose levels are, are back to normal without needing medication. So he particularly thinks about how type 2 diabetes remission works. 
and um, Professor Lean's research team in Glasgow were looking at um, whether remission could be achieved in GP practices. Um, so not in a hospital setting and not in a research um, setting, um, but where people are usually seen at their, their doctor's practices. And so this led to our research study called DIRECT. So indirect, we went into people's own GP practices, and that's one of the ones um, that, that we went into. And um, I was involved in training either the practice nurse or the dietitian um, at the practice to, to deliver this program for people. And so we stopped their tablets and we used something called a total diet replacement. That's the, the TDR. Um, and this involved them having a specially formulated diet um, of meal replacement drinks um, for about three months. Um, so they stayed on that for about three weeks. Um, and then we helped them to, to gradually reintroduce normal meals, one meal at a time, um, over a period of about two months. And this was to help people to learn what foods were healthy to eat and how much to eat. Um, to help them to, to keep off the, the weight that we'd help them lose in the first stage um, while they were reintroducing meals. Um, and then for the, the longest time of the study, um, we helped people to, to maintain the positive benefits that they'd got um, from the total diet replacement. And so we gave everyone support up to two years um, and they could, if they needed to reset things, they could have a period where they went back um, on the total diet replacement. So a total diet replacement involves um, four of the, the meal replacement drinks a day, and people didn't have um, anything else alongside other than plenty, plenty of fluids, sugar-free fluids, um, and maybe some sugar-free gum. Um, we do other studies at Newcastle University where people have vegetables alongside as well. Um, which gives them something to chew, so different approaches. Um, and they came to um, the Magnetic Resonance Centre at Newcastle University, so that's our, our research building on the left, um, to have scans done in, on their liver um, and their pancreas so that we could see how much fat was inside there, because the, the whole idea of, of type 2 diabetes is about the fat that was those bottom two triangles, the fat inside the liver and the fat inside the pancreas. And what we're aiming to do is to strip that fat out. And so we needed to be able to see what was happening inside the liver. Um, so this is on the right hand side. This is, well, it's our scanner behind um, the hairy dieters, who hairy bikers, um, who came um, to open our scanner. So they're scanning um, a globe artichoke there, which is um, on the picture at the front. That's inside the scanner. Um, but that's where all of our st study participants went into and so they would be lying inside that tube with their feet towards us and we take lots and lots of pictures of the inside of their body that allows us to to create an image of what's happening inside their liver and I'll show you one of those um, in, in a moment. So in terms of what remission actually does, this is, this is an animation that Diabetes UK produced about our study, about the direct study um, and I'll just play this and it gives you a little bit more um, information.
Great. So hopefully that helps in terms of um, understanding a little bit um, what our involvement was in the study. Um, and obviously it was funded by Diabetes UK and that's um, that's a lot of information on their websites. Um, but one of the things I get asked a lot actually is why, why we use the low calorie liquid diet um, of, of soups and shakes um, and could we have used food to do it? And the, and the answer is, is probably yes, um, because it really is about um, helping people lose enough weight to help them strip out internal fat from inside their liver and their pancreas. Um, but there are some advantages in, in using this and particularly in, in a research study and also where there's there's medical supervision at GP practices as well. So these are safe and effective and they're going to give people everything they need um, from their daily diet. They're specially formulated and they give people everything they need in a day but in, but in a, a small amount of calories but they do require um, medical supervision to do it. Um, and they're targeting those underlying causes of type 2 diabetes because the usual treatments where people take tablets or, or are taking insulin keep the glucose levels down but they don't remove the underlying cause which is is that fat inside the organs um, while people are, are on these um, soups and shakes, it gives them a chance to break some unhealthy food habits and, and they might be familiar to, to some of us like sitting, you know, sitting down in front of the TV um, and opening a packet of something and munching on it um, or having a biscuit um, every time you have a, have a hot drink. They're, they're things that um, our study participants told us that they did quite a lot. And so this period where they were, they were having the, the shakes um, helped them to break some, some unhealthy habits that they had. And then they've they've had a period um, of not not eating eating the way they used to, and they can learn how to eat healthily afterwards. And actually, for me as a dietitian, um, this study is is all about food and about helping to develop long term healthy habits. It's just that we use the soups and the shakes at the start as a way to to strip out that fat um, and and help people to get into remission. And then the important job is to keep them there. So I mentioned um, the scanner before, and this is just to show you, um, this is someone from the study, and on the left hand side, this was inside their bodies um, before they started. So. Um, the, the green, so the, we're looking up through their bodies. This is a slice through if they were lying in that scanner. Um, and the green area is their, is their liver. Um, and you can see from the scale on the right hand side that um, where, where it's red, that's complete fat. Um, the green in the liver, this was someone with 36% liver fat um, before they started the, the study. And um, a healthy liver fat is, is 5% or below. So, so a lot of people in, in the study with type two diabetes had this extra fat in the liver and afterwards after they'd um, been on the, the the soups and the shakes part of the study um, that was down to two percent liver fat and you can see that the liver now is black so that there's virtually no fat in there because it's all been stripped out so it's it's really effective from that point of view and the equivalent amount of fat so the the average amount um, at the start of our study was 16 percent and that's about equivalent to to a block of butter um, being inside the liver that that shouldn't be there and, and just some people with type 2 diabetes are very susceptible to store fat um, in the wrong places rather than under the skin where it's safe. So in terms of how many people went into remission, the blue, the blue bar here are the people who just had their usual diabetes care. And you can see it on the left hand side after one year was about 4%. Um, and about the same um, at the two year point. But in terms of our the group that, that um, did the shakes and then the support afterwards, um, we had 46%, so, so almost half of them put their diabetes into remission in year one, um, and it was a little bit less, but still over a third of them um, at the two-year point as well. Um, and that was far more, we thought it was quite important where that red line is. Um, if, we, if we'd managed to achieve that amount, it was thought it would be important for diabetes treatment, but we were quite significantly above that. Um, and so that was normal blood glucose levels off all diabetes medications. And these are, this is um, Derek, one of our study participants who like to go to Cyprus a lot. Um, and then this is Paul, one of our other study participants who had to change his bike because um, of the, the, the weight that he lost on the study. Um, he couldn't keep the bike down going around corners, which, um, which gave me a bit of a um, panic, um, but he got a nice light um, bike afterwards. Um, and then this is another one of our study participants, Kath, and I think Kath's quite good at explaining the importance of the, the healthy eating afterwards, so I'll just play this, this video as well. Hi, 
Hi, Alison. Sorry to interrupt. I don't think that I can't hear any sound. Um, so I don't know if you're able to turn it up at your end at all. I'll try. I, really, I can hear something, but it's very, very, very quiet. Is it low? Yeah. See if that makes. Oh, no. Hang on. I'm forward and through. Right. Hang on. Is that any better? No, I still can't hear anything. I don't know if everyone anyone else. Okay. I mean, if the slides are available afterwards, I can always put it on um, so that people can watch it because it's actually a YouTube video. Yeah, I can send it out after this session. Yeah, too. and you, or you can just search that on YouTube. Yeah. Captain's remission. Okay, brilliant. But the link should work um, rather than trying to fiddle on with my um, computer audio because um, I'm just looking at the time and I probably I've got a couple of slides to go. So that probably brings us about to time as well. But have a look. Kath, Kath will tell you all about our allotments and our grandchildren. Um, and it's just a couple of minutes for the video. OK. So just waiting for this to move on. There we go. So important to bear in mind, just in terms of what I've been talking about, that this, this um, study was for type 2 diabetes and the same thing doesn't work for, for type 1 diabetes, where it's really important people have to keep taking their insulin. Um, it's more likely to happen where people haven't had diabetes for very long. So it was up to, up to six years of having diabetes, um, because with a longer period of time, there can be some, some damage that, that we're not able to, to undo. Um, but there's still benefits for people in terms of, of losing, losing the weight and losing the fat from inside the organs. It does require um, people to lose quite a lot of weight um, to help them strip that fat out. Um, and also it's important that people who, who do this realize it's not a cure. So in the, we've had diabetes before, remission isn't the same as, as everything going back to normal and you can eat whatever you want. It's, it's important that, that we help people to change their habits for, for long term because otherwise they'll be susceptible to type two diabetes coming back. Um, and so it requires them to keep going with the positive changes that they've made and to, to keep their, their weight as healthy as they can um, to keep the, the type two diabetes away. Um, so the research, the direct research has been um, incorporated now into some guidelines. So these are some, some UK guidelines and also some American and European guidelines as well. And so rather than telling people that they've been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and they're always going to have it, people should now be given the option when they're first diagnosed with diabetes to see if they want to aim um, to try and put their diabetes into remission and to keep it there. Um, and then this was an announcement that was in, in quite a lot of the papers and you might have seen a few weeks ago this, this was actually launched. Um, and so the direct approach is being trialled more widely by NHS England and it's also being used in Scotland as well. Um, and so there's 5,000 people who are doing the same kind of approach with, with using, the, using the shakes at the start to try and shake off diabetes and then the support to, to reintroduce healthy eating habits to be more active. Um, and to keep the positive changes going um, over the long term. And that started just a few weeks ago. Um, so all very exciting and it's been a, a fantastic study to be involved in. Um, obviously I worked in diabetes before and I used to have the, the conversations around having a, a permanent condition and they're much more positive um, conversations now. So hopefully that's been um, interesting to see, see a bit about um, how diet can make such a big difference to, to something that affects so many people. Um, I have got time if, if anyone wants to ask a question or my email address is there if anyone wants wanted to send me an email and ask any questions afterwards. Thank you very much.